please welcome Ann DeWitt, General Partner at The Engine. I'm excited for us to speak with Dr. Sangeeta Bhatia. Dr. Bhatia is a MIT professor, an inventor, and a biotech entrepreneur who adapts technologies to enhance human health. At MIT, she is the John Jay and Dorothy Wilson Professor of Engineering, as well as the director of the Marble Center for Cancer Nanomedicine at the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. She is also an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. She's very unique in that she's trained as both a physician and an engineer. She's trained over 150 students, more than 200 peer-reviewed publications, and under her umbrella of work, more than 50 patents pending or issued. She also has the uh, really unique feature of being uh, not one, but an inductee to three of the national academies in the United States. She has also won the Lemelson MIT Prize, the Oscar for Inventors. She's an incredible person, and we're really delighted to have a conversation with her today about her experience, both as an academic, as an entrepreneur, and even as a CEO of a biotech startup. Welcome, Sangeeta. Thanks for having me. Hi, Anne. Hi. I, I'm really in, uh, interested in understanding how you and your research lab and the companies that you founded, they're at this convergent space. How did that come to be for you to operate in this, in this area of convergence? Yeah, thanks for that question. I think, you know, convergence is, a, is kind of a hot topic these days, but I think that, um, you know, there is a, a kind of training. Um, I was a biomedical engineer by training and then also managed to get my, um, my medical degree uh, in part because I just kind of fell in love with with, with the human body <laughs> as, I was, um, as I was studying engineering. And um, I think they actually very naturally go together. Both are really applied professions. Um, physicians have to treat what comes in the door, whether or not you know all the answers. Um, and similarly, engineers are sort of solving problems, even if you don't know really where every single atom is located. So they sort of really naturally go together for me. I don't practice medicine, um, but I think having that framework informs um, the way that we invent in my lab and the way we sort of take a new finding and start to kind of turn it around and think what it might be good for. Great. I'm wondering if, um, since you sort of started your career to now, if, you know, how difficult it was to sort of find, you know, like-minded, find students who are excited at working at these, these types of intersections I wonder if you could share with us sort of what it was like when you were getting started and kind of what you see, what you see today um, as you're working with the students, working with other, you know, company builders, bringing in investors to your company, sort of how that's changed maybe over the, over the years. Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting question. I mean, I think when I was getting started in science, I was frankly not sure I wanted to be an academic. Um, and I think that was in part because I didn't, I didn't see um, a lab that was exactly how I, how my brain worked or what I thought was exciting. And what I realized over time was that I could be excited by new knowledge, so new discovery, but I could also equally be excited by like a new widget, just like a new way of doing something. Um, and I was also excited by nothing really potentially new being invented, but making a clinical impact. Um, and, and so I sort of built a lab where I say that to the students. I say, you may discover something new, you may invent a new widget, you may make a clinical impact. Any one of those is welcome. I consider them all success. Um, and that's sort of what I've tried to create um, this little ecosystem around. So in light of that ecosystem that you were building and then sort of your first company, founding of your first company, what, what led to that? Because 
you were probably pretty happy like trying to figure this out. You've got all these students, different vectors, and then company founding. So I wonder if you could share with us what led to uh, first company being founded. Sure, yeah, the, the first company that, that, that spun out of um, my lab was called Heprogen, which is a tool company. And I have to say that I credit like my dad, actually, he's a serial entrepreneur um, with making me an entrepreneur um, because he, I think, was a little bit disappointed when I became an academic. <laughs> <laughs> and when I, um, I sat him down and told him that um, I was going to become a professor, he said, um, okay, but when will you start your first company? Not when will you start a company, but your first company. And that was sort of like imprinted that I, I was, he thought that that was a way to make impact and, and sort of I agreed. Um, and so, so Heprogen, the story of Heprogen was we had figured out how to make human liver cells kind of happy on a, in a dish, if you will. And I had the instinct that that might be good um, tool for pharma. Um, and in the beginning, what we thought that that would be useful for was toxicity testing. Um, so you make a new drug, it gets to the clinic, it's toxic in the human liver, and it hadn't been seen to be toxic kind of earlier in the pipeline. So that was kind of the earliest idea that we had. And I think what we learned um, as we started that company and we started to talk to the you know, customers was that actually that wasn't the most um, important use case for our technology. Um, and in fact, what I hadn't realized was that drug metabolism was maybe even a bigger problem than drug toxicity. Um, so the, the process of starting that company was I, I got a little grant, an um, accelerator grant from the Dish Bondi Center here at MIT. And I got some advisors, they call them catalysts, um, who would help me kind of think about what the markets were. I had a team of students um, that took a class at the Sloan School called Idea Stream, where um, they would come together and help us kind of work the problem. I think I took advantage of like every tool that MIT had, this is kind of pre-engine. Um, and then eventually we realized we, we probably had a company, we, we needed some capital. I think at the time we didn't know if we needed a smaller angel investment or venture. Um, and so we sort of went out and actually tried to do both. And it became pretty clear early on that we needed a, a really bigger check. Um, and so we decided to do venture. Um, and then my student was excited to do the company. By then he was a postdoc. So he signed up as a co-founder and then we were kind of missing an executive. So, you know, a common theme for me has been that's actually one of the rate limiting ingredients is finding an executive on your team. Um, and we, we managed to find through an introduction from the technology licensing office, um, an amazing uh, founding CEO named Bonnie Fendrock. And she came on for what's called sweat equity. So we couldn't pay her anything in the beginning. Um, she's actually married to Alan D'Andrea, who's a, a scientist at, at Dana-Farber and Alan had given her a year. And so she was like, okay, I have a year. I'll give you a year of my time for, um, for this wet equity, I had a newborn at home. Um, and we actually, we signed the term sheet for our first venture rounds, like in the 11th month <laughs> of her being with us. Yeah. That's really cool. So we had, so Heprogen and then Glimpse and then Satellite Bio. So, so now as you like reflect on those three companies and sort of how you would think about the early days at Heprogen and what you were thinking about, how that developed. And then now with the, the other two, which are very different, so maybe you can talk with us about sort of tools to through that progression. Yeah. How would you think about um, how you thought about those companies, you know, the same or differently early on, uh, especially now that you can kind of, you know, look back on, on at least a couple of those and kind of with, with satellite getting up and going. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great question because each one of the sectors, you know, kind of in the human health space has, has a pretty different revenue model. And so, you know, the advice that I got starting Heprogen, which is a tool company at the time was, you know, you shouldn't raise too much money because it's really going to be hard for you to get um, an ROI for your investors. Um, you should really try and be capital efficient and get the tool working and the sort of big question that we had was, should we be like a service company or a product company? 
Um, and so that, that was, you know, those are sort of classic tool company questions. Uh, then when we went to start Glimpse, um, Glimpse Bio is a diagnostic company. Uh, it was it was actually a moment where diagnostics were not um, were not in the heyday as they are right now. So nobody really wanted to invest in diagnostics. And um, another thing that kind of happens happens happened with all my companies is especially with Glimpse, those people would say like, "Are you sure you want to start a diagnostics company?" Like maybe you could use those nanoparticles as therapeutics. <laughs> and, and as a founder, there's sort of this interesting thing where you're talking to people and you're you're getting their reaction to your technology and you have to take in the important pieces, but you also have to know when to filter out the advice. Um, and this was a time where, where myself and my co-founder, my postdoc, Gabe Huang, were like, it's actually, we could have a therapeutic nanoparticle business. There are businesses like that. They're great examples all around Cambridge, but that was not the invention. And so what we wanted to take out into the real really world really was something that could help diagnose and monitor disease. And so we sort of stuck our ground, knowing that that would buy us like a complicated regulatory path and a complicated investment thesis. And we would have maybe different executives to bring on board and even a different investor base. And so that was a very like deliberate decision um, because we really wanted to advance that diagnostic technology. Um, and, you know, you mentioned earlier that I took operational role at the company uh, that turned out to be a consequence of making that decision because we raised some money and it turned out that we really couldn't assemble, you know, the team that we wanted, that we felt the, the, the project deserved. Um, and I had some amazing advisors, including Bob Langer and actually Stan Lapidus, who you introduced me to. And they turned to me at some point and said, Zingita, like, why don't you give take a sabbatical and give the company a little push? And so that's what I did. And I went to the FDA myself um, to sort of, you know, persuade them about what we thought the regulatory path should be. And, and we picked the lead indication. We queued up our first, you know, partner um, and, you know, and raised the Series A. And with all of that sort of de-risked, then, you know, it was quite straightforward to get like an amazing team around it and give it and get it going. Um, and then finally, we can talk about satellite at the end. That's in the cell therapy space, which is like a whole different story. <laughs> yeah, maybe just kind of double clicking a bit on stepping into that CEO role. I wonder, you know, how did your person, so I think it would be fascinating if you had some thoughts about what it felt like to like be the one responsible for raising that A and kind of what your experience was like as the one raising it. I think that would be lots of fun. And then also if you have perspective, um, what changed for you, like actually stepping into that role, if there's some new, you know, insights that you had. I, I know that you had worked pretty closely with Bonnie at Heparogen. You know, and now you're like stepping into that with Glimpse. Um, so kind of two different questions there, but would love to hear about what it was like to raise that A and then we can we can kind of take that step step back. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, the operational role and raising the A are, are, are a little bit different, but I think, you know, the operational role for me was really, really hard. <laughs> I mean, it was like, um, I'm a mother of, of two teenagers now, but but I felt like I had another newborn at home. Like it was keeping me up at night. You know, there was just, you know, every single dimension of the, every contract, negotiating the space, finding the partner, every single pitch, you know, just, just every single detail of the business is on your shoulders. And it felt literally like having a baby that was keeping me up at night. Um, and um on the other hand, like enormous things can happen in a year and, you know, the analogy holds, right? Like at the end of a year, typically a baby is walking and the same thing is true here with this like little newborn business. Like you, you look back on a year at the end of it and you think like, oh my gosh, we have this team, we've hit these milestones, we have these investors, we've, you know, grown our support base. So, so it's a lot like having a baby. Um, but uh, it's, it's, I think it's probably one of the most stressful things I've I've ever done being a CEO. I mean, for me personally, I know that people, other people seem to do it effortlessly, but for me, it was really, um, it was hard. It's hard, hard work um, and different work. Um, raising the A was, was really interesting for me. I tried to, as I said, diagnostics were not 
um, hot at the time, but there, it was sort of just coming up. So there was a whole Theranos piece, which we can, that's another hour, a different conversation, but also it was the early days of Grail. Um, so it was kind of really interesting. So like on the one hand, I was saying like, I'm different from Theranos that's happening on the West Coast um, and the potential of something like Grail is sitting out there. And I think it was early days in liquid biopsy and people were kind of curious about like, well, what is, what is going on there? And so I went out and found investors that could believe that there was something big to be had in revisiting this space. Um, and so that, that company was co-seeded by uh, Polaris and Arch. Um, and Bob Nelson at Arch had done Grail. Um, and then we fleshed out the syndicate around that. And so I sort of went backwards from like people that I felt could believe in the vision um, and, and really went out and get, got them and like targeted them and, you know, got the intro. Phil Sharp actually introduced me to Bob Nelson. And I was in San Francisco one day and we like, you know, met in the coffee shop and, and he doesn't look at slides. So I just like talked him into it and, um, and, and that was how it happened. So, um, and then the rest of the round, once, you know, the leads were in place, it was, was uh, more straightforward, I would say, but it was a tough one. I mean, it's interesting now to have done a therapeutic one more recently. Um, and, you know, the numbers are bigger on the therapeutic side somehow in terms of how much you need to raise, but people get it. Like you don't have to explain to people why it's valuable to invent a therapeutic. Yeah. I wonder if um, you have thoughts on kind of the right time to start a company. You know, now that you have multiple of them and as you're, you're talking with others and even within your, you know, your own lab and your own network, do you have a view on like the right time to start a company? Yeah, it's it's a great question and one I've asked a mentor of mine. So Bob Langer is um, is in the building with me in, in my center and he's somebody that I go to pretty frequently in the early stages of a project. Um, and I saw, once saw him give a talk where he said sort of cavalierly that you need three things to start a company. You need a patent, a high profile paper and a postdoc. And that was his form, you know, like that's the least minimal unit and, you know, we sort of laughed about it. And, but, but, but in some ways you at, at least need that, right? Like you need a, an important result, you need intellectual property. And if you're an academic founder and you're not planning on leaving, leaving then you need somebody who's gonna go with the project to make it work. Um, once you have those things, I think you need to find out, because if you're an engineer, right, you have a hammer and you have to figure out really what market you're going to go after. I feel like all of that should happen first. Um, and then you're ready to understand how much you need to raise. And then you can go out and start raising. Um, what I found over time is that it, it's sort of, um, it sort of becomes clear at some point that there's a forcing function for every company I've ever been a part of. We sort of like, oh, it feels like there's something here, it's bubbling up. And then there's something that happens that makes it have to happen. Like, oh, like with my last company, the co-founder got married and his fiance wanted him to move to Chicago. We were like, uh-oh, we better incorporate, otherwise he's gonna leave. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, every, every one of these has been like that, or, you know, one of the investors shows up and really wants to put in the seed capital or a competitor is coming and you see that they're going to go, you know, so, so there's sort of this sort of fuzzy time. And then all of a sudden there's some click that makes it has have to happen. Right. So you, you sort of mentioned it there, but maybe, and the, you had also mentioned kind of finding an executive, but I wanted to kind of double click on that as well. Like, what do you think is most difficult in translating breakthroughs out of the academic enterprise and like into a company? You kind of alluded to a few, but maybe we could just park on that for another, you know, minute or two, especially in light of your experience, you know, that executive team kind of need these things in place, but kind of what, what else in your experience might you hone in on and, or even how you thought about like how you find executives now and like that, that you have also been one. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, in terms of um, what are the critical ingredients, you know, I was lucky, as I told you with Heprogen that we found Bonnie and that was through an introduction and it, and that one happened, 
you know, it's funny, I had a conversation with Lita Nelson, who's our legendary TLO director at the time saying, I'm thinking of starting this company. I don't have a CEO. Like, can you tell me how this works? And she was like, oh, you just kind of like put it out in the ecosystem. Meaning, and I got, I'm an engineer and I like formulas. I was like, what does that mean? Like, what does that even mean? And she was like, you just start talking to people. And, and, and actually that is kind of how it happens. It's like, you put it out in the air and you mention it to somebody and you, and, um, and you network your way into folks somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. And to be honest, like I, I, um, the last, yeah, two companies that I did, I did that way. This one, uh, satellite, the new one we used a recruiting firm, but you have to have capital already to hire the recruiters. Um, so it is, I think, you know, there is a war on talent and those experienced execs, like that is a real rarity. And I think the the good news about tough tech and what the engine is doing is actually teaching that skill to the next generation, because I think it's eminently learnable. Um, and a, a fresh postdoc can absolutely learn how to jump in and take the role. Um, and so, you know, we have a bias for experience, I think in our ecosystem, but um, that's just a bias. Like there are plenty of fresh, fresh grads who can do it. Yeah. Very good. You also serve, I believe, on the board of Vertex, uh, as well as part of the Brown University kind of oversight as well. So those are, I think, are really interesting because they're, you know, looking at another academic institution, but also looking at a very large, and I'd say one of the most successful, you know, for sure, Boston biotech, you know, stories that we have. So I'm wondering, since you get those data points at the same time that that you're doing what you're doing. I wonder if you could share any insights from us also from those two other sort of polls that you have and how you integrate those yeah. into your thinking. Or things that I, I mean, I think, you. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. Like, I think that um, one thing I'll say just about all of um, my trainees at the moment is that they're very strategic and they, they come to me and they say like, questions like you just asked, like, how are you integrating those two perspectives? One thing I just want to share is that I'm actually not that strategic. I'm doing things that I'm really curious to learn about. And then I find myself in these spaces. So for, for Vertex, I was interested to learn about um, drug pricing and rare disease um, and, you know, found myself in that boardroom. And then for Brown, it was my alma mater. To be honest, my best friend is on the corporation and I was I was like, oh, I get to have like three sleepovers a year with my best friend and learn about my alma mater. And, you know, and so those are the things that you that you do. At the time, I had also done a third board because I was just kind of curious about like what else I might do in life. Um, and I, I did a, um, I was on the advisory board for the NCI, which is a government board. So I was doing, you know, academia, government and pharma. And for me, that was sort of, um, those were three things that I was just curious to learn about. Um, now I, I do find myself like in these different boardrooms and I think I've learned a lot of things. So at, at Vertex, I've learned about, I can look backwards at academia and early stage biotech as, as a profitable pharma company can and see and learn kind of what they see and how they see it, how they see these baby biotechs. Um, and that's, Sometimes it's kind of disheartening because you think like, oh gosh, we're so little when we start. We have so far to go before we're, you know, taken seriously as a real product. And it's, you know, 10 years before we're going to be in people. But on the other hand, like you can really appreciate the innovation that's happening in academia when you look backwards with that lens. Um, and so, so it's, um, I sort of feel that, that duality. Uh, and the boardroom at Brown, um, you know, I've met, met a lot of people in the financial services industry. So that's also been really interesting just to see how, how real estate deals get done, how, how the university has to connect to the surrounding ecosystem and the hospitals in that case, um, which in Rhode Island are, are undergoing some renewal. So yeah, I'm just learning all different things and how they come together um, when you start to think about bringing a biotech out into the world. Yeah. 
Yeah, just kind of another level of like the kind of the ecosystem required really to have these types of successes, um, both in medical innovations and actually getting them all the way to the patients. It, it, there's a long chain there that has to kind of come together to, to get it there. Yeah, that's there is. Yeah. And I, so just even on space, like I never thought I would be interested in real estate, but when you have a little baby biotech, like you have to decide, like, where am I going to put it? You know? And so I've always put them in Cambridge in an incubator and a shared incubator to start with, you know, that's like two blocks off campus. Um, yeah. And that's a really important piece of our ecosystem, I think. Yeah. And that location for you is so that it, you know, we, we think about that, like how important is that, that at the, in the earliest days, the company is actually close to their, their academic roots, their breakthrough lab, but sounds like you, you think about that too. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's important for me to like come and go, but I also notice, you know, in the beginning you're, it's, it's your former trainees, right. Who go to the company to, to work on tech transfer. And I think, um, I found that it's really important for the startup to feel like MIT. Um, people like that feeling when they like they even if there's there's ten companies together and they all you know used to be friends across the street and they're still there together. Um, there's that vibe of of um, you know kind of critical mass of ideas that that's really important. And I think you know if I had like my three students in in a little room somewhere, they wouldn't feel that same sort of level of excitement and synergy. So I think it's important for me to go back and forth, but it's really important for them. Yeah. So there's this uh, important new initiative that I think you're leading called the Future Founders Initiative. I think yeah. uh, you're, you're known for being a great advocate for women in STEM. And then with this initiative, uh, it looks like you're looking for the change and how to induce the change of female faculty founding companies from, let's say, kind of 10% up to 25% here, uh, 2024, 2025 timeframe. So I'm just wondering if you could um, share with us um, sort of what led to the Future Founders Initiative and you know why why this particular goal? It sounds like that that you've really set out there for the group. Yeah, thank thank you for asking that question. Um, I mean, I think it's I think lots of people have noticed um, that there are fewer women founders in biotech over the years. Um, and, you know, the numbers are well documented, even in venture. Right, two point seven percent of venture capital in the country goes to to women founded companies. Right, so the numbers are small and even less for minorities. But we, you know, we talked earlier about my sabbatical year. Um, and when I was out pitching that company, I those numbers landed on me really differently. You know, I was, I think, I mean, often the only woman in the room pitching a room full of guys, which frankly, as an engineer, I'm pretty used to. But also like I was trying to find a tribe of fellow founders who had my shared experience. Um, and there just really weren't that many women faculty founders. Um, and, and I, I just, I noticed it so deeply and, and it was so contrasting with what I knew about the innovations happening at MIT that, you know, all these amazing women faculty have inventions that I experienced all the time. And somehow they were not connected to the ecosystem that I now found myself on the other side of. Um, so coming back from sabbatical, I, um, I was interested to see how, what I could do uh, to address that. And then I was talking about how kind of lightning strikes and you and something happens to get you moving. The something happening was Susan Hockfield kind of raised her hand, the former president of MIT, and Nancy Hopkins, who's this amazing um, sort of gender equity pioneer. Uh, the three of us sort of got together and 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 it was like a real chance to do something about it. Um, so we started having conversations in Boston. We called it the Boston Biotech Working Group at the American Academy. In Somerville, Katie Ray came, she was fantastic. Um, and we just invited kind of all the stakeholders in town, the VCs, the university leadership, potential entrepreneurs. Um, and over the course of these six dinners, we kind of decided on some experiments that we would do. We would gather the data, we would try and get more women on boards, we would um, start a sabbatical program so that women could spend time in residence at VCs. 
we um, and then the Future Finder Prize competition, which you just you just mentioned, which we're about to announce, um, which will uh, be an incentive prize competition for starting with MIT faculty uh, to participate. Um, kind of like a Shark Tank, but we're calling it the Dolphin Tank. Right. <laughs> I was just going to ask. Um... I think I think it's not quite a year, but I'm wondering how's the receptivity been, the engagement, like the interest, um, female faculty, the the supporters, other stakeholders. I wonder if you could share with us, you know, kind of what you're seeing so far and things that you thought were there, that are in fact there, um, the desire, uh, or things that may have surprised you, sort of in this first block as you're getting getting that initiative up and going. Yeah, I, um, you know, I think people have been really excited to help um, and not clear on how to help. Um, and so I think it's been interesting to sort of like offer people very specific things that they can do. So the, for the venture capitalist community, for example, to say, okay, let's diversify the boards of the companies in our portfolios. So it's like a very concrete thing. Let's try and give them quantitative targets. Um, the women faculty... You know, not not all founders have to be faculty, but that was what I, that we were focused on as a starting point. And you know, we've had a lot of conversations, and some of them I think have perceptions about what it means to start a company um, in terms of because they observe what it what their guy colleagues do, right? And so, you know, I'm going to have to go out to a lot of dinners with VCs. I'm going to have to get out on a plane and pitch my company on the West Coast and so on and so forth. And so some of the conversations that we were able to have were, were to say like, well, maybe there are other ways to do it. Um, and, you know, actually, interestingly, the pandemic has actually been, was, was for us, for Satellite, was a huge opportunity. Like we were able to pitch international investors that historically, like you would have to travel to that country to, to get an audience. But because it was a pandemic, everyone was taking meetings across time zones. Um, and our syndicate is, is West Coast, Boston-based and, and um, Israel-based, uh, you know, which, which we pulled together completely virtually. And so to have that conversation with women faculty and say, look, I know you're busy, I know you're teaching, I know you've got young kids, but you could probably still do this. You just need someone in your lab to help you, at, you know, the right intros, X, Y, Z. So that's been a really rewarding conversation to have. Yeah. That's really exciting. And I think many of us uh, are looking forward to how that's continuing to have success here in the, in the coming years as, as people are um, taking up some of those initiatives and some of those goals that you're setting out there and seeing where we can get to. I think that's very exciting. On the COVID uh, pandemic, I was, I was gonna ask what the impact of the COVID pandemic was on that initiative. I was also curious on um, entrepreneurship uh, with inside of MIT, your own research lab. I was wondering how you would describe sort of what that impact has been from your perspective over these past 18 months and what you see as um, really, you know, as we're even as we're going forward here for the next, you know, two years, five years, you know, if you have thoughts on how that um, is going to play out and really continue potentially to impact sort of how we live, how we receive health, how we work through supply chains. Just very curious on what you've seen over the past 18 months and then going forward. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that COVID is, is interesting. Everybody sees things through their own lens, you know, when they think about it. Um, and certainly starting a company, we actually, we satellite, we put on pause in the early days of the pandemic because we thought like, how, oh, how could we, how could we, um, you know, but by sort of August, September, it was clear that the sector was still going and, and we decided to sort of go for it. And we, you know, closed the round the night before the election. So November um, and, you know, hired the whole team virtually and moved into an incubator. And, and you know, that all happened during the pandemic. They had to figure out how to um, work on a shift and, you know, it, it, just all the things that we all had to figure out as on top of being an early stage startup. So that was you know, in, some, in some ways really remarkable and, and energizing. I would say more broadly, I mean, as somebody who's really always been passionate about the role of diagnostics in oncology, 
um, it became very clear that this is a sector that's important. Um, and I think no one would argue about that um, in a COVID moment. And then you heard that I run a nano medicine center at MIT and you know, the mRNA vaccines are delivered in lipid nanoparticles. <laughs> and so now they've been in millions of people. And so like, we're all, you know, doing a little jig about like what it means for our technology and everything else that, that we can now do now that we can deliver mRNA. So, um, you know, I think it's something that we're going to continue to live with, but it's, it's really inspiring to see how a really urgent medical need can can advance technology, you know, team science at the at the absolute biggest scale, you know, aligned with policymakers and healthcare providers. Yeah. Yeah. When you had mentioned NCI earlier, and then we were just starting, you know, again to kind of touch on um, a little bit of the the government's role, right? Particularly during the pandemic. But I'm wondering if you have a set of thoughts on you know, that relationship between government and academia has, has been there. But now also as we're getting into like the um, entrepreneurship, government's always, you know, played a role. Seems like there may be an increasing role with what we're seeing now in terms of government engagement and public-private partnership. I'm wondering, just given, again, your experience, if you've got thoughts on, you know, the how that will look as we're rolling forward or what would be a really good way for that to look like as we're rolling forward in the engagement of government in the earlier stages of entrepreneurship and companies making progress. Yeah, I mean, I think this is different. I know that, you know, the engine works across sectors. Um, and so the role of government is, is really different in the different sectors. I think, you know, in the human health sector, the regulatory agency is, is a big part of the equation for any early stage startup. And it's amazing to me now um, as an entrepreneur, how much I didn't learn about that, you know, in graduate school or even as an academic, I could publish papers and have new ideas. And I think, you know, just didn't really have a sense of the framing of the agency. Um, and also when you invent things, you invent new things, like they don't naturally fall into the buckets of how things get regulated. Um, and, you know, knowing what I know now, I think, you know, I can change the way I invent, um, understanding how the FDA might look at my inventions. Um, but, you know, most new things don't aren't squarely in a, in a bucket. So, for example, I'm really excited about synthetic biology. Well, what is that? <laughs> you know, is it, is it a drug? Is it a device? Is it a biologic? Is it a is it two of those things? Or you know, or data, right? Like digital and AI. Well, what is that? Um, and so, you know, I think the evolution of regulation is an important part of the conversation that's happening right now. Um, and so, so for for satellite and for Glimpse, like that, what we called regulatory clarity was one of our earliest milestones um, as a company. And so it's just something that I've like learned to appreciate that I hadn't, hadn't, hadn't been in my, you know, frame of mind prior. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, maybe um, to just to touch on sort of the artificial intelligence, machine learning, the role of, I'd say sort of fairly advanced either you know, software optimization, um, we haven't really talked about that, but I think that was that's probably worth uh, a quick note as to how you think about that as yet another dimension to be integrated. Um, what that can offer is just um, you know far more advanced than ten years ago. I'm wondering how you think about um, the collaboration with other colleagues at MIT or how that gets incorporated um, as you've seen companies over these you know over a decade and more how that's becoming either fundamental to companies or um, sort of a new layer. Just wondering what you've seen because you're really close to that inside of MIT with many initiatives, even across, you know, sort of across institute, um, new, uh, new uh, focus. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how that's evolved, probably especially over the past five years or so. 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, so as you're alluding to, we have a new college of computing um, and our, you know, has our Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, which I'm a part of now has a third pillar, which is AI and decision making. Um, so I would say, you know, it's, it's changing everything. <laughs> and even some of the projects, you know, or startups that I see that you are not obvious quote data plays, like I think require a data lens. You know, you, there, there is gonna be a place in your company where data is changing the game. And if you don't see it, it's just, you're not looking. Like, so there's some part of it that that is, is going gangbusters in the data domain. Like maybe it's on the discovery side, maybe it's gonna be on informing your clinical trials, maybe it's gonna be on real world, readouts for, you know, whatever it is, like their data is going to change your business. And so, and in the last company that, that we started, my co-founder and I, um, Chris Chen, who's at BU, we just hired a data scientist, like literally in the beginning, like when the team was like 10 people were like, we just need one of these. We don't really know. <laughs> we never thought of this as a data science pro project. It was a cell therapy company, but we just knew that we needed to make that investment because if you don't have the, the, Pat, you know, if you don't have that mindset, you won't even bring it into the company. You have to have it. Right. It's like a fundamental skill. Right. Yeah, that's that's uh, super interesting. I'm wondering if we could use that uh, also into a segue into the areas or the frontiers within medicine, human health, nanomedicine um, that you're finding most exciting if we look out like how the how the world could possibly change in five, 10 years and the things that you think are on the frontier and just you're you're really excited to to work on and see others work on. Yeah, I think, you know, we were talking earlier about like different lenses. So I think there's like the technology lens, like they're the technologies that are coming that I think are this is really exciting to see them happening. Right, and that those are things, maybe the obvious things that synthetic biology and genome editing and delivery and and um, the fact that we can make living medicines. You know, there's I think that's happening. And you know, I I was a graduate student in the '90s. We talked about it for a long time, but it's really happening now. These are regulated products. People are paying for them, um, and it's it's just amazing. Like really, the genome is our toolbox in a way that it never was before, um, coupled to data and personalization and precision medicine, um, which again, like we, we never really had the wherewithal to, to think about personalized therapies or personalized diagnostics. So that I think is all happening. That's the technology piece. Um, what I like to do sometimes with my physician training is to take a step back and look at the clinic and say like, what are the really big unsolved problems? Like forget the technology, but like what, what do we really still have no idea how to do? Um, and there are a lot of those things, you know, metastatic cancer still has immunotherapy is promising, but can't touch everything. Early detection of disease, truly early detection of disease. Like we're not there yet. Um, and, and, you know, you can go disease by disease and, and, and really think about that. And so I think it's worth always pairing the excitement about the new technologies with like the longstanding unmet needs in medicine. And I, I try to kind of hold them in my head at the same time so that when I find a new technology, I can see whether it's connected to that like sort of grand challenge. I'm really interested in global oncology, which is something people don't talk about. Um, you know, cancer kills more people than HIV, TB and malaria combined globally. Um, and you know, the community is just really, the global health community for the most part has not thought about cancer. Um, how do we screen in a resource poor setting? How do we treat in a resource poor setting? You know, those are huge challenges. Yeah. So when we were talking to, to get ready for talking with the group here, I was really fascinated by your use of the word hacking. You didn't <laughs> yeah. use today. And then, I didn't, yeah. And in contrast to how I think most people think about the academic enterprise, so, so that, that was fun. and. Um, through that conversation, um, I remember you had some really interesting thoughts on, um, I, I would frame it this way, but it's just how you thought about what you needed for, I'm going to call it like an entrepreneur brain and what you mm -hmm. need for like academic brain. And so I'm wondering if you could kind of 
share some of those thoughts on how you were thinking about, I'd call it like your entrepreneur brain and what, you know, sharing advice with the entrepreneurs and maybe the potential female founders, you know, that we have, female founder faculty even that we have in the audience and how, how you have those two different brains that are working, yeah. working together. Yeah, I think that that is a great question. And I think they are really different parts of your brains. I mean, I think as an academic, and you know this, like you're trained to be rigorous and precise and, um, you know, add foundational knowledge to the canon, right? Like that, that that's our job. Um, and as the entrepreneur, you know, you're selling a dream, right? And you want people to follow you and you it's very clear that all the answers are not known and you don't know all the answers in the moment and you still have to convince a whole bunch of people to work with you to make it happen. Um, and I, I mean, I think that's kind of when we were talking about hacking because it's sort of like, you don't know the whole answer and you might change course and this might be the wrong way or the right way and the, the marketplace is changing as you go. And it's, it's like the opposite of being like a very deliberate, systematic academic. Um, but at the same time, when you discover something academically and you think that it can make a difference for patients, you have to take it into that world where, um, where you're selling the dream and you're asking people to take a chance you know, on you and your dream and taking it into patients. Otherwise, it, it, you're the only one really who can see both sides. Thank you, Dr. Bhatia, for talking with us and sharing all the experiences that you've had from being an incredible sort of academic and it's in your own right, being an entrepreneur and being a biotech CEO and sort of that, that look across that full spectrum with us was really incredible uh, today. So thank you for that.